I'd like to welcome everyone to Wednesday night Bible study, especially if you're visiting with us tonight. It's time to begin now. If everyone would we'll start off with song number 221, 221. There is sunshine in my soul. After this hymn, we'll have a, a prayer, and then we'll be dismissed to class. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky, for Jesus is my life, over sunshine, blessed sunshine, while the bees fall at me no much God, we thank you for this another opportunity that we have to come together as brothers and sisters to consider your word. We pray that you might be with those that have prepared lessons. We pray that they might be able to recall the things that they have studied. We pray for us as students that we might listen attentively. Heavenly Father, we pray for those that we know of that are sick, those that are bereaved over the loss of loved ones. We pray that you might be with these people and bless them and help them to regain their health, if it be thy will. Pray that you'll be with us every day in our lives. We pray that we might live good lives. Pray that we might be an influence to others. We also pray, Heavenly Father, that you might forgive us of our sins. Pray that you might go with us now through the remainder of this service and on through whatever future life you see fit to give us. Finally, in the end, if we've been found faithful, we ask for that home with thee in heaven. In Christ's name, amen. Good evening. Wow, what a great crowd we have here for our midweek Bible study. We're thankful for everyone's presence, especially, as Jimmy said, any who are visiting. We're so glad to have you here with us tonight. We'll dismiss now with the nursery preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes. Middle school and high school classes dismissed.
I do. I do. Thank you, sir. I'm missing Chris and Martin. Those usually help me out. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> yes, sir. Good evening. Good to see everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. We are. We're doing well. We just can't. I told somebody I wish we could go a week without having a sick youngin' or be sick ourselves. Noah's not feeling well tonight. But go ahead and turn to Second Samuel. We left off there uh, last week. We didn't get through what we were talking about with David's. David Drain, and I got this right this week, I, I picked up kind of where we left off, well at least the slide we left off, we covered all this, <clears throat> uh, this is about where we left off, we were talking about David's 40 year reign, and I don't have all of these up here right now, but I don't know if I've mentioned this in several weeks, I have these these handouts that are being handed out right now, the, this, they're handing out period number nine, which I hope to get into tonight. Uh, if I don't, if I happen to run out of time, then just hold on to those for next week. Uh, I've got several extras of period number eight here if anybody needs those. Um, or if you need extra ones going back, I mean, obviously this, was, this one is eight and they're handing out number nine. So if you need one through seven, or all of those, or a combination of certain ones of those, let me know. They're all on computer files. It's very easy to print those out. So I'm just littering up the front pew here. So if you, if you need some of those, let me know. Some of them I have. And do what? What you need? Eight? Oh, I could have brought that to you. Is that it? So anyway, I've got, I've got some up here, but if I don't, like I said, it's easy to print them out and get them to you. Uh, what questions do you have so far over anything that we've covered up to this point? Maybe, maybe there was something, person, situation that you were wondering more about. Maybe you thought we'd cover it more, but we didn't. Uh, I've, I've, I've tried to hit the high points, but obviously we're going pretty quickly, so even, even getting the high points is uh, hard when you're moving through the Old Testament this quickly. We've, we've been able to slow down a little bit here lately, but uh, anything at all, now's your chance to ask that question, make a comment or something. All right. Period number eight, of course, is the United Kingdom. Israel asked for a king to be like everybody else. That was, that was their motivating factor. It wasn't because they, uh, they wanted to please God. This was actually against God's will because he was their king. They were a theocracy. They wanted to be uh, a monarchy. They wanted to be have a king like everybody else, a king who's going to lead them out into battle and uh, fight for them and all that. And so God says, you, you asked for it, you're going to get it. You're going to regret it, but you've asked for it, now you're getting it. So he gave him a king. King Saul was the first one, of course, 40-year reign. David is who we're getting near the end of his reign, where we left off last week, 40-year reign. Of course, Solomon reigned for 40 years. And very easy to remember those, because if you get the number 40, you've got each, each king. Uh, but David... David takes over at the death of Saul, and of course he had at least two chances to kill Saul himself, and he wouldn't do it because that was God's anointed, and he says, I'm not going to do that. God's going to make me king, but he'll do it in his time. I'm not going to, I'm not going to presume, take it upon myself to kill Saul and, uh, and, and put myself on the throne. God will do that in his time. But there was this temporary division because of uh, Saul's son, Ishbosheth, who began to reign. Ishbosheth crossed his main general, Abner, he made a foolish uh, and un, unfounded accusation against him. Abner defected, and with that, the Ishbosheth was pretty much undone because Abner was just that good a general. Of course, Joab kills Abner because he was upset over something that had happened before uh, with a battle in which Abner had killed Joab's brother. Some of that sounds like a soap opera or something, doesn't it? But uh, so. David begins reigning, and of course he reigns seven years in Hebron and the rest of the time in Jerusalem. 
2 Samuel 7, God promises David that the Messiah would be of his, that is, David's seed. He, of course, you know, this is kind of what we left off with last week. Uh, David says, I want to build the Lord a house. He says, here I am, I'm dwelling in this nice, um, this nice palace, and I've got a nice house, but the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is in a tent. And, of course, the, the tabernacle was a little more than just a tent. If you go to Exodus and read about all the elaborate design, uh, it, was, it was nice. But his point is well taken that, you know, he says, look, I'm living in a house. God's Ark of the Covenant that represents his presence among his people is dwelling in a tent. And so he wanted to do something about that. Well, God says, no, you're not going to build me a house. But then, of course, the kind of a, I don't know if you call it a play on words there, but God says, I'm going to build you a house. And it's not a physical house, it's a spiritual house. First uh, Chronicles 28, hold your spot in Second Samuel. I, I, I wanted to look at this last week, and we just ran out of time. Whoops, I'm in Second Chronicles. Don't make that mistake. You, you can get into trouble. I had a, a buddy when I was in preaching school, and he was up uh, preaching in chapel one morning. Or no, it was in a class where we were working on New, New Testament expository, I think. And, but he was talking about the kind of preaching that we need today. And he says, uh, he says we need preaching like 1 Timothy 4.2. More preaching, like 1 Timothy 4.2. If we had more preaching like that, the world would be a better place. Well, he meant 2 Timothy 4.2, where he says, uh, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Right. But he said 1 Timothy 4.2. Well, 1 Timothy 4.2 says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. <laughs> so you can get into trouble when you mix up first and second. Sometimes it's not a big deal. Sometimes it makes all the difference in the world. Uh, 1 Chronicles 28 David assembles all the princes of Israel, the princes of the tribes, and of course it goes on. Uh, David says, verse 2, As for me, I'm about midway through that verse, I had in mine heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God, and it made ready for the building. He, he's even gone to uh, lengths to prepare for it. In fact, the prophet, uh, let's see, it wouldn't have been Samuel, it would be Nathan, actually told David... Go ahead. And God says to the prophet, no, I didn't okay this. And so he kind of, he kind of went a little bit ahead, and, and it, I don't think God was necessarily getting on to him saying, you sinned and you're in danger of, your soul's in danger here, but he was just kind of saying, hey, don't, don't speak out of turn here because God says nobody consulted me on this. David's not going to build this house for me. Solomon will. But, of course, God's going to build the house for David, a spiritual house, and that's the church. But he says, I had in mine heart to build a house for, of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of God, made ready for the building. But God said unto me, Thou shalt not build a house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war and hast shed blood. So, of course, he goes on and talks about God choosing him before all the, uh, to be king over Israel forever, before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he had chosen Judah to be the ruler of the house of Judah, the house of my father and among the sons of my father, and he liked me to make me king over all Israel. Well, that's talking about God placing David in that exalted position. And, of course, by that promise in First Samuel or 2 Samuel 7, David's descendants, and, of course, ultimately looking to Christ. But Judah being the ruler, that goes back to Genesis 49.10, where Jacob is blessing the, his 12 sons, and he says, uh, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, uh, nor lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Uh, God's exalted Judah, the leader, and of course, uh, the kings came from Judah, that tribe. It, there's a, there's a uh, succession after David. And even when the kingdom splits, a son of David or a descendant of David will always be on the throne uh, in Jerusalem, with the exception, of course, of the usurper Athaliah, and we'll talk about that when we get there. She, she usurped the throne for a, a short period of time, but she wasn't. Uh, she wasn't the queen. She was just there because she, she had killed, or so she thought, all the king's sons. But anyway, God had made Judah that exalted tribe, and of course, eventually the Messiah would come from Judah. Um, oh, I was in First Chronicles 28. I think I covered there what I wanted. I just wanted to get to that last week, and we ran out of time. Uh, verse 7 says, Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever. Um, He's quoting here God, was what God had said about Solomon, 
and, and his descendants, if he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments as at this day. So God says, God gives a reason to David why you're not going to build a house. It wasn't just an arbitrary decision. God says, you've been a man of war. There's been a lot of bloodshed under your reign. Your son Solomon is going to have a reign of peace. He's going to build the house of the Lord. Of course, Solomon also built a very elaborate house for himself, but he did kind of oversee the building of the temple. And uh, David gets everything ready. So basically, when Solomon gets ready to do this, the materials are David's made some deals with Hiram, uh, who, who had, would float the cedars down from Lebanon, down the, down the uh, river there. So everything's set up for Solomon to do this, but David does not do it. It'll actually be Solomon that will coordinate and oversee the building of the temple. 2 Samuel 11, I believe, is what we were, the next thing we were going to cover when we completely ran out of time last week. We mentioned Mephibosheth, right? Jonathan's son? Seemed like I recall talking about that. We did? Okay. Uh, David, David asked, is there anybody of the house of Saul that I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? And so Mephibosheth sits at the king's table for the rest of his life. He restored land to him. And then you come to chapter 11. Of course, chapter 11 is pretty much the darkest chapter in the life of David. One of the evidences, by the way, of the Bible's inspiration is the Bible does not gloss over the mistakes of its heroes. You would be hard-pressed to find a greater hero in the Bible than David, as far as just mere mortal men. You'd be hard-pressed to find a better one than David. I mean, he went out and fought. He goes, he goes up when everybody else is cowering in fear, and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? I will, I'll fight him because I know God's on my side. He shows great faith. Uh, he, he's not just a, a man of faith. I mean, he's a man of military prowess. He is, uh, he's tough. He's very cunning. He's just a hero all around. But you know what? He made a terrible, terrible mistake in 2 Samuel 11. Not even a mistake. He just outright presumptuously sinned. It's very interesting because the Bible talks about David. It says he's a man after God's own heart and all these wonderful things about him. But the Bible even says he was, he was perfect and upright in all his ways, save in the matter of Uriah. He really, really messed up here. But you know what? The story of David and, and his great sin here, it's, in one way it's very depressing because you see this great man of God and the, the horrible mistake that he makes. But in another way, it's very encouraging because we learn from that that even when we have these, uh, these spells where we just sometimes, you know, I think everybody's probably got something in your life where you look back and you just go, what on earth was I thinking? Sometimes somebody may say to you, you know, after something happens and say, what on earth were you thinking? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. Or, or sometimes I've even heard of folks that, that said, you know, they maybe were asked that question. They say, well, I was thinking I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. I, I'm, I know better than that now. I've repented of that thinking, but that's what I was thinking at the time. And, and I just did what I wanted to do, and I want to make that right. But you know what? God doesn't say, no, if you had done anything else, if it had been a mistake or a stumble, I would have let you come back. But you, you had your eyes wide open. You knew what you were doing. You turned your back. You walked out. So you're gone. No more chances. Can you imagine? I mean, God would have every right to say that. God had every right to say that to David. I mean, here's a man... That the, the getting back over to Second Samuel, just just go here and look at the the account. It always sort of depresses me to read this because you read all the things about David and it just gets you excited and think about all the things that he did. And I always love to read about how he has a chance to kill Saul and he shows his uh, he shows his his class. What a class act he was. He doesn't kill Saul even though he's got the chance. I mean, how many people, here, here's your enemy in a, in a dark cave. He doesn't even know you're there or he's asleep on the ground. And you go, boy, you're not so tough now, are you? Whip out your sword and just take him out. And David doesn't do it. And so you always get excited reading that. And then I always get to 2 Samuel 11. It just sort of brings me down. Because, I mean, here's a time, it's a time, verse 1 tells us, when kings go forth to battle. Why is David not in battle? That's what the kings did at that time. They went out to battle. Why did he not go forth? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us that, and so I could spend all night here guessing about it, but at the end of the day, it'd be just that, guessing. I don't know why he went, 
But sometimes unwise decisions put us in bad situations. And so sometimes you may make a decision, was it sinful for David to stay home? No. But he put himself in a situation where now he sort of, in a roundabout way, led himself into temptation. Because he goes up for a stroll on the roof one, one evening, and of course he sees this woman bathing. Now we talked about this a few weeks ago when we were studying uh, this subject of pornography. That you know, there are times as as men and, and women too that you see things, especially in, in the world in which we live, and the television programming in which uh, that is displayed many times on television, even commercials. Uh, we we talk about this a lot with uh, several folks that I watch sports with or sporting events. That even you know, a sporting event can be completely benign, but the commercials many times will have awful things on them. Or sometimes, what was it? Uh, it was SEC championship game, I think that. Some of us were watching, and, you know, I, I told him, I said, I don't know if the guy that's in the truck directing that thing was just a pervert or what, but I've never seen so many shots of immodest cheerleaders in my life as I saw during the SEC championship game this year. And so you got to learn sometimes just to avert your eyes and bounce your eyes, as one author put it. But David doesn't do that. He looks, he lusts, and he says, send for her. Bring her to me. And so, of course, she ends up pregnant. And David, even at this point, okay, he's home, he, he fell into temptation, he didn't, he didn't bounce his eyes or revert his eyes when he should have, he, he gave in to the temptation, he committed adultery. Even now, are you going to make this right, David? But he doesn't. What does he do? Sends for a husband. Of course, where was he? I don't think we mentioned that at this point. Most folks know. He's, he's off fighting for the king, so that he can maintain his kingdom. So he says, well, bring me Uriah, bring him home. And so he brings Uriah home, and he says, oh, good to see you, Uriah. So, you know, just, just wanted to give you a little furlough, buddy. Hey, go home, be with your wife, enjoy the night. What does Uriah say to that? He says, with all due respect, King David, my men are out there sleeping in the field. They're away from their families, their wives. And it wouldn't be very fair, wouldn't be very respectful for me to go home and be with my wife and my family while they're sleeping out in the field. You see the honor of Uriah. So David, at that point, doesn't, doesn't say still, doesn't say, boy, you know, I've, I've really messed up. He says, hmm, well, now we've got to go to plan B. So plan B, and you see how this thing goes many times when you get yourself into a situation like what David has gotten himself into, it compounds. And it's like the old story, when you tell a lie, then you have to tell another lie to cover that lie, and another lie to cover those two lies, and it just keeps getting worse. Well, David's situation is snowballing quickly. So now he says, well, all right, plan B. You're not going to go home to your wife, says, uh, hey, hey, Uriah, come in here and have a drink with the king. Well, what are you, what are you going to do? You sure don't, you don't say no to the king in those days. So he goes in and he has a drink. And the king gets him drunk. And now he's got a drunk man on his hands and he says, Hey, go home and be with your wife. And even in that state, Uriah says, I can't do this while my men are out there in the field. Just wouldn't be right. So David says, Huh. You know, here again, another chance to, to do the right thing. But what does David do now? What's plan C? I'm just going to kill this guy. I mean, everybody's going to know that his wife's having a, a child by somebody else because he's off in battle. He hasn't been home to be with his wife. And they're going to start asking questions. And eventually he's going to come back to the king. So, boy, you've got a good old-fashioned political scandal here. So David decides, i got to get rid of this fellow. This is where he really gets presumptuous, he turns his back on God and goes against everything. I, I, I believe, perhaps, and I don't know that it'd be a stretch to say this, but perhaps up to this point, you might could say David's kind of stumbling, he's making mistakes, not, not with plan C on Uriah. He's got his eyes wide open, he knows what he's doing, he sits down, he writes a letter to the guy who's, I guess we would call him the general in charge of the battle, and he says, attack 
and get into the hottest part of the battle. Make sure you rise in the hottest part of the battle. And when the battle is at its fiercest, just tell everybody to withdraw from him. He signs it, he seals it, and he gives it to good old Uriah. And so Uriah says, yes, sir, I'm going to deliver this message just like you want me to because that was the kind of man Uriah was. He takes it to the general. Guy reads it. I've often wondered what, what must that general have thought when he read this. Is this for real? What, what is he doing? Uriah's a good man. He's a good soldier. He's an honest, hard-working man, clearly. Why would the king want to do this? But at the end of the day, he's the, he's the king. And you know, if you've ever been in the military, you obey orders. If, if you want to be in the military for very long and not be out on your head, you obey your orders. So they put Uriah in the hottest part of the battle. They draw back. And that's another thing I've often wondered about is what Uriah must have been thinking. As they charge that city, and then all of a sudden he looks around and where is everybody? Why on earth would they leave me all here by myself? Well... You know the rest of the story. He gets killed. And so David waits a few days for the morning, and then he takes Bathsheba as his wife. And now everything's a okay, right? Because she's my wife now, and so when that child is born, everybody will know it's David's child, and, and that's okay. And so some time seems to have passed before Nathan the prophet comes to him, and that's when you get to chapter 12. And, of course, Nathan tells this this parable or I don't know if you call it a parable or a proverb, probably more like a parable, I guess. But he says there was this rich man and there was this poor man and the poor man had nothing except for, as the, as the country preacher said, that one little ewe lamb. But he had this one little ewe lamb and it was so special to him. But here comes this rich man that could have had anything he wanted and what does he do? He goes and says, hey, I'm taking your, I'm taking your lamb away from that fellow. And so, of course, in the story, who are the, who are the principal characters? Or at least who are they representing? The rich man is David, the king. And the poor man is Uriah. And, of course, the ewe lamb would represent Bathsheba there. But he, David hears this story and he's furious. And, I mean, understandably so. Who wouldn't be? It was a man of character and a man of integrity. He says... The fellow that's done this thing, he is going to, he's going to die. Now, you, you put yourself in that situation. You've already had to come as a prophet of God and say this, tell this parable to David the king. You can see the color rising, his anger rising. And he says, boy, the man that's done this thing, he is going to die, verse 5, into that verse. And then verse 6, he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. David says, I ain't putting up with that. We're going to take action. And now you picture the courage of the man of God, Nathan, when he looks him right in the eye and says, thou art the man. It's you, David. You did that. Look at what he even says. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel. I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. You remember all those times Saul was chasing you? You lived through it, David. I brought you through that. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. Who killed him? He says, you did, David. You've killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and has taken his wife to be thy wife and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me. God says, you despised me in this action and has taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. How be it? 
because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child and Uriah's, that Uriah's, Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. Well, it's interesting because he also says, you've given great occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme his name. And so this was very severe, and God's going to punish David. It's a, it's a very severe punishment. But da what David did was, was very severe, and, and David understands that he is, in, in fact, you can read several times in the Psalms, we, we sometimes refer to them as penitential Psalms, where David is showing his penitence from these activities, where he says, you know, I, 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 I watered my bed with my tears, you know, and on and on he goes about a, a broken and a contrite heart, a broken spirit and a contrite heart. David understood later how serious this was. But when you read this passage, especially the words of Nathan as he's speaking on behalf of God here, you begin to understand how serious it is in the eyes of God when we know better and we just say, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. And sometimes people don't admit when that's the case. And so we have to be honest with ourselves sometimes because it's one thing, and this, this is a New Testament doctrine. We can, of course, the New Testament clearly teaches that a child of God can be lost. Uh, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Paul talks about to the Galatians, he says, if you try to be justified by the law of Moses, you're fallen from grace. So we can fall from grace, we can be lost, but at the same time, God doesn't want us going around constantly wondering, well, am I saved? Am I, am I right with the Lord? Uh, you know, he doesn't want us doubting all the time. But understand, if there's one thing God does not tolerate, one thing that will cost me my soul quickly, it's presumptuous, hard-headed, stubborn sin and rebellion against the will of God. He does not put up with it. The rebellion of Korah shows it in number 16. Numerous passages in the Bible show it. God says, look, you're my child. And when, you, when you're in Christ, that's one reason why we emphasize to folks the need to, to repent of their sins, confess Christ as Lord, and to be baptized, to have their sins washed away. Because the, the Bible tells us, Acts 2.47, when we do that, Christ puts us, he adds us to the church, Acts 2.47. So that's, that's why that's so important, because where is grace? Where is forgiveness? It's all in Christ. And so once I'm in Christ, there's grace there. And I may make a mistake. You know, people used to use the illustration. I remember hearing this all the time when I was growing up. Well, what if you were to have a car accident and maybe the, right before impact you said a bad word or you even thought a bad word? Can you, I mean, people used to say that all the time. I remember people bringing that scenario up all the time. I don't, I don't wonder about that. I know what would happen if that were the case. That's a person who's in Christ. They're covered by the blood of the Lamb. If that's not a presumptuous, hey, I don't care, I'm just going to shake my fist at heaven, so to speak, and and sin, then that's a person who is walking in the light. The blood is continually cleansing from sin. That is the biblical doctrine of preservation of the saints. Now, it's possible to be lost. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we've talked about this before in a sermon where sometimes people running away from the once saved, always saved doctrine, they go so far as to have a, a child of God who's always in doubt as to whether or not he's saved. And God doesn't intend that for us. God wants you to know, you're my child. I love you. And, and as one fellow said, he, he used the illustration that God loves us so much, he says, you'll go to hell over my dead body. And he laid down his life for us and died. That's how much God wants you to go to heaven. That he gave his son and he said, I'm, I will give my life before I just sit here and let you go to hell. If you go to hell, it's going to be because you choose to do so. And so David's sin is a great illustration of, of a principle there that, that needs to be emphasized with God's people. We need to understand God wants you to know if you are his child, if you're in Christ, he wants you to know I love you and the blood is going to keep on cleansing you. And if you make a mistake, acknowledge it, make it right, learn from it, do better, but know that God says you're my child and I'm, I'm going to save you if you're striving to live as I would have you to live. But when you get into this situation of presumptuous sin and you decide, I'm going to do what I want to do, and I, if I have to cover it up, if I have to kill somebody, if I have to do this, that, or the other, I don't care, I'm going to do it because this is what I want to do, then you don't have a chance of being saved when that's your attitude. So I want to constantly examine myself and make sure I don't have that attitude. 
And when you get into chapter 13, thought we were going to fix that clock, Brother Jimmy. All right, chapter 13, let's, let's move. Man, you got, me on a, you got me on a passage there that I really, really love. It's, it's kind of depressing, but boy, it's, there's also a lot of encouragement in that, I think, because uh, I learned from that if I'm striving to do what God would have me to do, I don't have to worry all the time, am I saved? But I need to be cognizant and examining myself to make sure I don't ever have that haughty, presumptuous, self-willed mentality. But you get into chapter 13 and David's sin comes, starts coming back to haunt him already. Now, David's been forgiven. Nathan told him that in chapter 12. There was, there was no mistake about that. The child died. David fasted and, and, and prayed and hoped that the child would get better. And then when the child died, he got up and, and carried on with his life. And, of course, his servants were saying, what is going on? He's, he acts like nothing's wrong. And David said, look, when the child was sick, I was praying. I, I didn't do anything because I want to know. I, I thought maybe there might be some chance that I could beg and plead and maybe God would change his mind. And if any chance there that I could do that, I wanted to do that. But he says, now the child's gone and I can't bring him back. I can go to him, but I can't bring him back to me. And so he, he begins to uh, carry on. But there were consequences of his sin. Remember, we just read that in chapter 12. One of those consequences is the sword will never depart from your house. So it begins in chapter 13, Amnon. He falls in love, or lust, really is what it was, with his half-sister, Tamar. He tricks her, and he rapes her. He brings, gets her, tricked her, tricks her into coming in there, tricks the king into sending her in there. He rapes her. Absalom is furious. Absalom says, I am going to kill him. And, of course, that's what he does later on in that chapter. And then Absalom, of course, knows he's killed one of the king's sons, even though he's a king's son himself. He knows he's in trouble, so he runs. He flees and gets out of the country. Uh, chapter 14, Absalom comes back, and then David actually forgives Absalom. But then chapter 15, you know what Absalom does? Now he's going to commit treason. He has an uprising against his own father. This is all part of the consequences of David's sin. God's forgiven him, but you know and I know. I, you don't need me to tell you this. Sometimes we can be forgiven, but consequences linger on from our actions. And ask, uh, there, there's a brother I know that he, um, years ago, he got behind the wheel after having drunk alcohol. And he was, uh, he would, he'd tell you, he wasn't even, you know, was, as the old saying goes, three sheets to the wind drunk or anything. But he got in there in the vehicle behind the wheel and he hit a family. And he killed all of them but except one or two. He went to jail. Now, he was restored. He was a member of the church. It was wayward. He was restored while he was in prison. But this man went to jail. He did several years' time in jail. He came out. Uh, in fact, there's, a, there's an interview with him. If you, uh, I, I think I've still got it in here on DVD. I can make a copy if you ever want to watch it. But uh, we did about a two-hour interview or maybe an hour interview with him for GBN one time where he just, uh, I mean, he just broke down on camera. And he said, I have to live with this every day of my life. He said, I wake up, I can, I can see those people, I think about those people, and I have to know I took their lives. They weren't members of the church. He said, I took the lives of people that were not in a saved relationship with God. And he said, I've got to live with that every day of my life. And so there are consequences sometimes that linger on long after the sin and long after even the forgiveness of the sin. And so Absalom, he has an uprising. Of course, Absalom's sitting in the gate, and he's telling people when they come, and he's saying, hey, what... Uh, what, what did the king say about your situation? Well, the king said such and such, and he says, oh, well, that's too bad. You know, if I was the king, I would have done whatever. And he tells them what they want to hear. And so the Bible says he stole the hearts of the people. So Absalom has this uprising. David flees, gets out of town, uh, and he escapes Jerusalem, and he escapes Absalom. Uh, chapter 16, you've got Mephibosheth's servant helping him. Shimei curses David. You have Ahithophel who gives advice. He's a very, very sage man, and his advice was like inquiring at the oracle of God, the text says. Ahithophel says, what you need to do, Absalom, is you need to go up on the rooftop in the sight of all Israel and go in unto your father's concubines. And that'll show that you, you mean business, and you're taking over, and your father is out. Well, of course, he does that, and again, that was part of what God had said would happen to David because of his sin. Then in chapter 17, Ahithophel gives more advice. He says, I tell you what, what I'd do. 
King uh, uh, Absalom rather says, give us some advice to hit the fell. And he says, here's what I'd do. I would go after him and I would crush him right now while he's on the run and I would just wipe him out and then you'll be king. Absalom said, boy, that sounds pretty good. Well, then he calls this fella Hushai. If I'm pronouncing that right, Hushai, I don't know how to say it. Some of these Hebrew words are, are Greek to me. <laughs> but uh, Hushai, he had already... He had already been with David, and David sent him back and said, Look, may, it may be that God can use you to help defeat Absalom's plans. So you go back. You're not going to be any help to me. So you go back and see if maybe you can be sort of a spy. We might use that terminology today. So Hushai comes in. Uh, Absalom says, Well, let's ask Hushai for his counsel. Hushai says, Oh, no. Don't go after him. You know your father's a man of war, and he's probably going to whoop up on that first group of people that you send out after him. And when he does, then all Israel is going to hear about it and the people's hearts are going to melt and they're going to think, boy, Absalom's defeated, he's destroyed, he's on the run, he, he's not ever going to be able to defeat his dad. Well, now Absalom says, hmm, well, you know, you may be right. He says, I'd wait. Let him, get, let him get holed up in a cave somewhere and then we'll go, we'll come upon him and we'll just wipe him out. We'll find him. And if, if he hides in the city, we'll pull that city into the river if we've got to. But we'll get him. Just, let, let's just hold off for a little bit. Well, of course, he's doing that because he then sends men to David to tell him, I bought you some time, get over the river Jordan and get into hiding. So David does that, he goes over, uh, he gets in hiding. Ahithophel, the big baby, uh, finds out that his advice wasn't followed. You know what he does? He goes home and hangs himself. He's so upset that they didn't follow his advice, uh, which it blows my mind how a man can be that wise and give that kind of good advice, but he's, he's so apparently self-centered or something that just because his advice wasn't followed, he's mad and puffed up, so he goes home and hangs himself. I don't know who he thought he was going to hurt by doing that, but that's what he did. So, chapter 18, Absalom's death and defeat, or defeat and then death, of course. Uh, David hears about his son's death, he laments, and if I remember correctly, I believe it's Abner who actually does pulls the trigger, so to speak. Not Abner, I'm sorry, Joab's who I'm trying to say. Yes, he put him through the heart of Absalom, verse 14 of chapter 18. Yeah, I told you, Joab, not a, not a real nice fellow. Of course, Absalom had that long hair. He, he goes under this tree. His hair gets caught, and he's, he's stuck there. Some folks suspect it was his hair originally, and then he kind of got caught with it, maybe his chin and his head between boughs. But whatever it was, he was, he was suspended, and he was stuck. And so these young men come to tell Joab, and of course, what was David's last remark to him as they left? Huh? Deal gently with the young man Absalom for my sake. Now, would I have agreed with that were I a general in David's army? No. I'd say we ought to kill this guy and we ought to, we ought to take care of him if this is how he's going to do. But again, when you're in the military and it, you know, it gets back to what we were talking about with this presumptuous attitude toward God, we're in the Lord's army. Who's, who's the commander in chief? You've got, you got to follow orders. And so the order was, you don't, you know, you don't, don't kill him. Of course, Joab comes along and says, what are you fellas waiting for? You're not going to do it, I will. So he, right, to, right through the heart there, and he kills Absalom. So Absalom is defeated. David hears about it, the death of Absalom, and he laments uh, great grief coming from David about Absalom. Uh, you know, you get that at the end of chapter 18. He was much moved, went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. As he went thus, he said, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would God I had died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. They told Joab about how the king was carrying on. So chapter 19, you actually have Joab coming and he rebukes David. Now, this is one occasion where I think Joab probably had a pretty good point. He says, Look, you're turning a day of victory into a day of mourning and a day that pretty much feels like defeat. You're, you're killing everybody's morale. Because you are just so distraught here over your son. Now, you know, of course, flip side of that is David lost his son. So anyway, Joab rebukes him and he says, look, David, I understand you're upset, but you've got to, you've got to for the people's sake, you've got to go and uh, you've got to return to Jerusalem. You've got to take the throne back. You, if you just stay up here and weep and mourn, you're going to lose the kingdom. In fact, he even threatens, um, you know, he's going to defect to the enemy, so to speak, if, if David doesn't straighten up and, and go make this right. So he does. And um, Chapter 19 is where I mentioned, I think we talked about this last week, where David actually says, verses 11 to 13, he's going to make Amasa the captain of the host in place of Joab. 
And Joab, later on in chapter 20, verses 8 and following, he comes and says, that's, that's, that's Joab's M.O., and that's what really bothers me, and I think that's probably what bothers, uh, bothered David to the point that he tells his son Solomon, you make sure you take care of him. Because Joab's M.O. is not... When, when Abner killed Joab's brother, it was in a battle. And he actually tells the brother, stop, stop, I don't want to hurt you, but I, you're going to force me to do something I don't want to do if you keep pursuing me. And he wouldn't stop. But Joab's M.O. is to, as he does there, and you'll, you'll see it in chapter 20, verse 8. He, uh, Joab's garment that he had put on was girded unto him, and upon it a girdle with a sword fastened upon his loins and the sheath thereof. And he went forth, as he went forth, it fell out. Joab said to Amasa, Art thou in health, my brother? You know, he, he, he did that with Abner. Took him aside peaceably like he was going to talk to him. And Joab took Amasa by the beard with the right hand to kiss him. But Amasa took no heed of the sword that was in Joab's hand, so he smote him therewith in the fifth rib and shed out his bowels to the ground and struck him not again, and he died. So, you know, once again, you've got Joab pretending to be nice to somebody, to be peaceable, and then he, he kills him. Chapter 23 is kind of the last words of David. We might call it the annals of David, so, so to speak. Um, I actually want to... I saw a sermon one time, and I want to kind of develop it into my own from the idea that I got from a, uh, another fellow, but uh, David's mighty men, some, some good material from that, and eventually I want to preach that at some time. But uh, he, here's where he's called the sweet psalmist of Israel, chapter 23, verse 1. 23, 2, he says, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. We talked about that, how it relates to inspiration. Uh, back up to chapter 22, you have a psalm of praise for God's deliverance. And note particularly verse 4. We sing this many times with our young folks, and we sing it here sometimes in worship. But this is a psalm that comes directly from Scripture. We're actually quoting Scripture when we sing it. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. And then the chorus of that song is verse 47. The Lord liveth and blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. And I was trying to look, see if I get a cross reference for what psalm that is because it's actually more word for word the song is from the psalm, not the psalm here in Second uh, Samuel. Has anybody got a cross reference there that you see? I'm going cross-eyed looking at all these references. What? 144. I got so many cross references here; they're all running together. Anyway, it's it's it, the song actually the song that we sing is more word for word from the Psalms reference than from here. But anyway, that's interesting. A, a song that we sing is basically straight out of Scripture, and, and we have several like that that we sing. And then the chapter closes out with David. The book closes out with David's sin and numbering the people. Um, he got he got kind of proud again or something here, and he decided to number the people. Don't know all that was entailed in that, but uh, Joab, again, here's one time where Joab actually tried to talk him out of it. But it says the king's word prevailed over Joab. So they go out, they number the people, pestilence breaks out because God was so unhappy with David about this. And David goes to this site. And what's interesting about the end of the book and the end of the chapter, what site is this? Not currently, but what site is it going to be? If you, if you remember, this is the threshing floor of Arona, the Jebusite, but it's the future site of the temple of God. David purchases it here. This is where the temple will be built. But I love this passage, love it, for what David says at the end of the chapter here, verse 24. Well, 23, really. The king, well, Arona basically says, I'm going to give it to you. You're going to use this for sacrifice to God to stay the plague. I'm giving you this piece of land. David says, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Verse 24. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. I think it was Brother Wendell Winkler that said many years ago, and it is so true. He said, A religion that costs you nothing is worth exactly what you pay for it. David says, I will not offer to God of something that doesn't cost me. What is it costing you to be a child of God Almighty? It's not costing you something. Well, as Brother Winkler said, it's worth just what you're paying for it. But true religion costs us something. All the servants of God throughout all the ages, and I hope you're seeing that as we go through the Old Testament history, 
these servants of God, they paid a price to be God's children. They didn't earn the right to be God's children, but they, they paid a price for it. They paid it gladly because they understood that true religion, godly religion, the religion that is right, going to heaven, it's worth sacrifice, it's worth suffering, it's worth whatever it costs to get it, to obtain that salvation that now is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Um, boy, I don't know what happened there. We ran out of time. We'll look quickly at the life of Solomon next week. Hang on to your period number nine and we'll start talking about the divided kingdom because Solomon's reign, there's not, uh, we won't say as much about that and then we'll start looking at the divided kingdom and some of, some of that material. Anything else? Quick questions or comments? If you, don't, if you don't have anything right now, then let me know next week. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. My favorite section here, but I keep running out of time.